I've alluded to the fact that over the couple past couple months, really since the end of August, uh, I've experienced at various times symptoms of uh, heart palpitations and kind of like uh, lightheadedness, a little bit of trembling, and, and these classically, oh, and a dry mouth and uh, some nausea also. And all of these symptoms are classic symptoms of panic attacks and anxiety. I don't know if you have anxiety attacks, but symptoms of anxiety and panic attacks, however you wanna uh, describe them or define them. And it was a very confusing situation because I was not overwhelmed in terms of mental anxiety, in terms of like the state of the world. So what did make me anxious and not panicky, but anxious was the fact that this was occurring and I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. Because again, I didn't feel like I fit the classic description of someone who was having anxiety because I wasn't kept up at night by my thoughts. I was able to concentrate fine as long as my body felt normal. And I've done so much work on this aspect of life of letting things go and challenging thoughts and all of that through mostly Buddhist psychology that it just didn't seem right that I would be experiencing these uh, these symptoms unless I was completely delusional and I wasn't doing any of these things that I thought I was doing that I hadn't made any progress in my life but I didn't think that was the, I didn't think that was it yet here I am having heart palpitations and the problem was I'd get the heart palpitations uh, at night usually and when that would happen I wouldn't be able to sleep and now I wouldn't sleep the whole night and now I'm extremely exhausted. My body feels really thrown off. I can't eat, I don't feel right. I just don't feel normal in my body. And it would take me days, often a week to recover. And the more, the more you feel off, the more anxious you feel about it. Because again, you don't know the origin and you don't know when it's gonna end. So went through this a couple times and you know it was kind of a waste, <laughs> September, October, and into the early part of November was kind of a, a large portions of those months were completely lost to me in terms of work and other things. I just couldn't respond. I just, I just felt so off. So what happened, what I, and this is what I think happened. Two videos ago, I was showing how I was just, or talking about how when you bring your eyes together to stare at a computer screen or a phone, when you converge your eyes, I was talking about how that increases tension in your neck and will increase tension in your body. It will also cause you to habitually use your visual system very close up and that produces strain in your eyes and your eye muscles are really strong, but it also kind of teaches you to, to see more narrowly. So you stop using expansion. You stop using the periphery as much. And I showed how in the Journal of Optometry, the optometrist who was writing an article was saying that when he got people to diverge their eyes, when he got them to get their eyes to come apart through use of a, of a, of a prism lens, that act of divergence allowed people to breathe more naturally. So what happened was they were decompressing. They were unrestricting their body because they were unrestricting their visual system. Eyes are huge. It's the highest level of sensory processing. So what your eyes do, your body will follow for, to a large degree. So if you're creating tons of convergence and, and strain with your eyes, that will be reflected in your body. It's going to converge also and tighten. And people will often feel, feel tight through their diaphragm and through their midsection. But it can really happen anywhere in the body. You can feel pain or discomfort due to, to convergence excessive tension is what we're talking about, pretty much anywhere. It can be in the feet, it can be in the knee, the hip. It just, that, that, tight, that tightness of the body, the tension, prevents you from shifting from side to side during normal movement. It prevents you from expanding your rib cage during inhalation and exhalation. It's a tension issue. Now, so what I think happened with me, so, that, so the point being, the more you use your eyes incorrectly or up close will change how you breathe by default. You'll start to use your neck more, but it, it's also going to change your body's physiology. Once tension goes up, I mean, think about it. People who are going through a panic attack, is their tension high or low? Well, it's high. 
and they can't breathe properly. They start hyperventilating. So I think I was living in a state of hyperventilation without even realizing it. And it makes sense to me because I remember one night back in maybe April or May, in the beginning of COVID, or actually maybe two or two and a half months in, I remember waking up one night and I'm noticing that I was breathing really, really quickly. And I thought, I remember thinking to myself, why am I breathing so quickly? But I kind of filed it away and whatever. Over months and months of doing that and being on video calls where I'm staring at a screen and my eyes are coming closer, converging, which I was feeling in my neck. I already knew that. Uh, my tension was rising and I started to probably breathe too much. Now, when you breathe too much, under I'm pretty sure I'm going to have the science right, but you can double check me. I'm not an authority on this. But under normal circumstances, most people have enough oxygen. They don't need more oxygen. I think we're most people are between 96 and 98 percent of saturation. Like we don't need more oxygen. What we need to do is use that oxygen more effectively. But it turns out that carbon dioxide levels are what tells your brain or what allows you to breathe or what allows you to use that oxygen more effectively. Uh, when you hyperventilate and you breathe too much and too quickly and too deeply, your carbon dioxide levels can decrease. When those levels decrease, your brain no longer knows how to utilize the oxygen that it has already available. It doesn't know how to use it effectively. And the bond, the, the, the molecular bond between the oxygen and the blood that it's riding in, the, I guess the hemoglobin, becomes stronger when CO2 levels go down. And now you have a harder time utilizing the oxygen that you already have, but now you sense it as not having enough oxygen, so you start to breathe more, which just makes you breathe out more carbon dioxide, which makes this, the situation even worse. So the, the trick, and this is what I learned from the Oxygen Advantage book, I highly recommend you buy it or just read it somehow. The, the trick is to bring your CO2 levels back up. And the way you can do that is by breathing less. So what happened to me over months of video calls and talking too much and breathing too much, I was living in a state of hyperinflation uh, or hyperventilation, let's put it that way, and not even knowing it. And it threw off my entire physiology. So by doing these exercises in the, in the book, I, was, I have been able to readjust my body. And luckily, I have not had any of these heart palpitations in the past three weeks. Actually, I feel really good right now. I'm actually, you know, like I said, I'm kind of practicing running up my street and it's working. Uh, I'm using breath holds while I do that. I'm holding the air out. Uh, I'm controlling my breathing on the way back down the hill. So I'm always trying to create a deficit of oxygen in the sense that if you think that you need to be comfortable, you need this much air during your inhalations, during your breathing, instead, what you do is you only take in this much. So you're creating this deficit of, of oxygen intake. You think you need this much to be comfortable, and you only take in this much, so you have this area, this in-between area is gonna make you quite uncomfortable. And what you're doing is you're bringing CO2 levels back up and increasing your tolerance for CO2 levels, carbon dioxide levels. And as you do that, you're even you're kind of balancing out your, your respiratory system and resetting it and, and getting this oxygen and carbon dioxide level uh, ratio. I don't even know if it's a ratio, but you're just getting the carbon dioxide back up and that has seemed to make a huge difference in my life. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person that's going through this because I've talked to friends, other people who've ex who are experiencing the same symptoms and people will automatically assume they're having anxiety or panic attacks when in reality, one of the symptoms of having lower CO2 levels is anxiety feelings and panic attack feelings and uh, lightheadedness, trembling, uh, catastrophic thinking. All of these things can be associated with having the CO2 levels that have dropped too low. So, uh, you know, I wanted just to get that out there that I'm pretty sure people are going straight to medication without really needing it because that's what I was offered by my doctor. And I was like, I don't think I'm there yet. So, and physically I checked out, like they took, I had an EKG done, that was fine. And 
my blood level, my blood work is fine. Everything is normal. My blood pressure is good. Everything's good. So there was nothing physical going on except my breathing. I, 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 my CO2 levels, I think, again, I think three or three weeks is a pretty good time period of knowing whether I found a solution or not. And I think I have. Now, the other thing is this. So if people ask me, what's the, what's the one thing I would recommend people to do right now because of the current state of the world is uh, experiment with some uh, oxygen advantage breathing methods. You might be surprised. And so that's what I would have people do. If people said, what's the one exercise you're gonna do? That, for as far as, I would say, as long as you don't have any medical issues that would prevent you from doing that, uh, I would work on breathing first and make sure that your CO2 levels have not dropped due to the stresses, anxieties of a COVID world and too much computer work and too much talking on Zoom or whatever you do for a living, because I think it's pretty common at this point. Again, I don't think I'm that unique. I like to think I'm unique, but I'm not that unique. So I know this is happening to other people. So that's what I would recommend. Read the book, do the, do the, the, uh, the exercises, and you can even incorporate these exercises into your training, into your running, into your weightlifting. Anything that's gonna create this deficit of what you think you need and what you actually give yourself, and things will start to work out better. I would also say that, you know, make sure, the other thing I'm doing is I'm getting out in the sunlight earlier. Uh, I'm going for a walk earlier in the day to get optic flow. And if I was talking about that in the other video also, that that is hugely important. Um, and that gentleman, Andrew Huberman, I think his name was, uh, he was the one being interviewed in the podcast that I had mentioned. And uh, he's, that's one of his big things uh, is optic flow. And of course, PRI has been talking about this for years and years and years. I get people neutral. I get their tests to change by giving them optic flow. I've done this numerous times. Actually, the majority of people, I don't do tech that. I'm not tooting my own horn in any sense. I just understand it differently because I've had this experience myself. Uh, you can get people's ranges of motion to change completely. Shoulder into rotation, straight leg raises, adduction, abduction, just by having them walk forward and noticing the world pass them by, on the, particularly on the left side. So optic flow relaxes your body. If you're not moving enough, if you're staring at a screen too much, your eyes will tighten. And when your eyes tighten, your whole body tightens. And now you can, even when you do move forward, you're so tight because you're completely compensatory, then optic flow is not even gonna work for you because nothing's moving in your body, not properly at least. Um, so, you know, that's really important, getting outside. He was talking about, uh, this Andrew Huberman, was talking about getting outside earlier in the day, and I hadn't thought about this. Uh, getting outside earlier in the day, so in the morning, so sunlight hits your eyes and it, and it jump starts this cycle of waking up and then this 16 hour cycle of, you know, 16 hours later you start to produce melatonin and you know, you, you get prepared for sleep. So that was another thing I'm doing. Uh, well, I've only been doing that for a couple of days, so I'm not sure what effect that will have. The optic flow I already know is huge. And he had one other suggestion, I just don't remember what it is. But as much as possible, try to surround yourself with other humans that you like. Uh, be with others, because that's how we regulate our own bodies. We don't regulate ourselves with ourselves. You live in relation to the environment, you live in relation to other people. And a lot of us have lost our ability to regulate our own physiology because of the circumstances of living in a COVID life, which a lot of it is isolation. And even if you live with other people, uh, like your own family, that is sometimes not enough. And I think a lot of people will admit that, that you need others in your life also. But the important thing is that you have other people in your life to regulate you. We need other people. It, your, humans are not designed to... Be, so, some people can be monks and they can you know, meditate for 23 hours a day by themselves, but even they still have a community for the most part, uh, a community in which they live. So they will see other people. So we can't regulate ourselves by ourselves. We, well, we can, but we need others to help regulate us. You know, otherwise, what happens when tension goes too high? How do you relieve it? If you're only by yourself and only with your thoughts, unless you've done some, a lot of work on that, you're going to have a hard time regulating your own, uh, your own body. So other are you laughing? Are you smiling? I noticed 
when I was going through this, I wasn't smiling and laughing very much. And I was like, wow, I'm really not laughing anymore. Le if you're laughing, you're enjoying yourself, you can't be unhappy. So remember that. It's one or the other. So are you with people that make you laugh? Are you watching things that make you laugh? Or are you just watching the news? Are you watching CNN and Fox and all of them watching Trump and Biden and just watching the election, post-election madness? Uh, are you watching, you know, death stories and violence on TV? Does your brain know the difference between real violence and fake violence? Maybe not. Are you overloading yourself with too much sensory input, too much bright light, too many screens, too much sound? Can you shut down? That's really what we're talking about. Uh, regulation. You have to be able to down-regulate your system because we're so amped up, we're so jacked up because of the circumstances of life. Things that have been completely normal in our life have been completely taken away. And then uh, I think our breathing is, is another thing that you can control if you take the time to, uh, to, to really learn about it and take the time to do the exercises that you find in the Oxygen Advantage book. Other people might say, well, what about Wim Hof? I'm reading the book. I'm reading Wim Hof's book right now. So I don't really have a great, um, I don't have a, much to say about it at this point in time. I don't know enough about it. However, I just know what worked for me was this Oxygen Advantage book. And so hopefully that, that uh, video, everything I've said here has been helpful. If you find this video interesting or helpful, could you like it, share it, subscribe to the channel, comment, anything will help. Thank you.